It's like celestial beings from on high bringing me the gift of joy from just merely gazing at its otherworldly brilliance. <sighs> the Sennheiser MKH-416 short shotgun microphone. You know, the one that all the best movies were made with. We're going to test it out. All that plus all the nerdy stuff coming right up. So, good day and welcome to the Time Preservation Society. I'm Bond. James Bond. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit that bell notification so you can be notified of new content right when it drops. Cheers. Today we're looking at the well-loved and mega-classic Sennheiser MKH-416. This one right here. I'm using it directly into a MixPre-3.2 and will be for the entirety of this video with zero post-processing of any kind. This is raw 416 power. The 416 is a super cardio shotgun microphone that's made in Germany and was originally designed to be used outdoors but can and has been used indoors for decades. Listen to the sound of this thing. Now we're talking. This is literally pro league. I'm booming with it about a foot away from my mouth right now and I've purposely left it in the shot so you can see it, just the tip. Though I'm doing no post processing, I might have used a limiter in post. Check the screen right now to see if I did use a limiter. The 416 was first introduced by Sennheiser in the mid 70s to complement their MKH line of innovative microphones. So we'll call it 1975, which was Jaws and the Rocky Horror Picture ago. Man, I remember Jaws. This is me on set with Robert Shaw, Roy Scheider, Steven Spielberg, and Richard Dreyfuss in 74. We were taking a break, horsing around, you know, good times. Anyway, there's a lot of tech stuff that goes with the 416 story, like T-Power uh, and the RF principle, but I won't bore you with that information. If you want that data, let me know and I can direct you to all that super mega nerd information. I do basic nerd, advanced nerd, and even go as high as mega nerd, but I never go super mega nerd here. Never go super mega nerd. It's a bad idea. Anyway, by the early 80s, all the Hollywood movie sound mixers and boom ops were using the 416 on set. It became such an industry standard in movies that it was referred to as just the Sennheiser or a Sennheiser, similar to Kleenex or Scotch tape. It's not just its beautiful sound with crisp highs and well-rounded lows that attracted Hollywood. It was its robust design, seemingly indestructible. Its RF design allowed it to be mostly unaffected by humidity, extreme cold or heat, or bad weather in general. It is built to last, and I love things that are built to last. I love them. They're my favorite. There's no way you've not heard this mic thousands of times or more. It's been a Hollywood staple for decades. You've also heard it on many voiceovers for TV commercials and also for movie trailers. You know, the in a world things. In a world where all microphones were outlawed, one man defied the odds and became a Sennheiser. Let's have a closer look at it. The 416 comes with this cool 70s style case. Inside the case is the iconically shaped pop filter, a mic clip, and of course the mic itself. The 416 is a super cardioid microphone that sometimes behaves as a hypercardioid with mid and low frequencies. Incredibly directional with a great reach. It's got a frequency range of 40 hertz to 20 kilohertz with a self noise of 13 dBA. The mic looks and is very simple. There's no switches or knobs of any kind, just a long tube. The pointy end is the front of the mic and the back here is an XLR connection. The grills on the side here are part of the interference tube. Its design is to reject sounds coming from the sides while allowing a tight beam to be picked up from the front. It runs on regular, plain old, unleaded 48 volt phantom power. There are no batteries. It's well RF shielded since the body is made of brass. The 416 is well known to be a workhorse mic and is often the very first choice for challenging weather shoots when filming movies. It's also often a first choice even without weather at all. It's just a first choice, period. The included pop filter is iconic in its shape, as I said earlier. It's well recognized by location sound people all over the world. And it's quite needed too. Like any small diaphragm condenser mic, 
they are susceptible to wind noise. This usually isn't a problem when it's fixed in one place like I'm doing right now. But when you're swinging the boom, you'll want to protect the mic from air movements. So it's good practice to always keep that pop filter on, unless you're 100% sure there won't be any air movements around the mic. For outdoors, it's always good to put the mic in a blip, a Zeppelin. It weighs 172 grams. It's heavy enough to let you know that it's well built, but lighter than others. The DDS Mic 2 is 200 grams for a comparison. It measures, oh, hold on a second. Let me just find my trusty old measuring tape. You know, this measuring tape was manufactured in 1999. I picked it up in an underground city called Zion in 2199. Anyway, it measures almost 10 inches long and has a diameter of three quarters of an inch. Although this mic was originally designed for outdoor film sets, it is very often used indoors as well. It works in both scenarios, but with one caveat. If you're indoors and you're in a small reflective room, the bouncing reflections will enter the interference tube and cause a weird phasing sound that is sometimes impossible to remove in post. That's the trade-off. It sounds great indoors, but just make sure you don't have all kinds of quick reflections happening close to the mic. For this reason, I opted to record this video on a couch as opposed to the usual table I'm sitting at for my videos. However, if you want to hear this mic with me sitting at my usual table, look no further than my road wind protection video, which is right here. I recorded that entirely with the 416, just so you know. Right then, let's test the 360 of the thing. Okay, so I've got the 416 off the boom pole here and have it pointed about six inches away from my mouth. Listen to the bliss of this thing. It sounds good. You can hear the windstorm happening outside. It's windy again up in the far north. Anyway, 360, let's do it. Here we go, we are moving it, and here we are, we can already hear it. Half-axis coloration, and this is the side. And we're gonna keep moving it. And now we're hitting the rear. Here's the rear lobe. And now we're gonna keep moving it to the side again. And uh, now we're gonna move it facing my mouth again. So you can hear this thing. I mean, listen to the sound of this thing. I kept the pop screen on it because I didn't want any plosives to ruin this examination. But this is the sound of this microphone. So this is coming from the side, and as you can tell that it's kind of ignoring that I'm doing this. Even when I'm this close, you can hear my voice over my snapping, which is rather loud, watch. See, pretty good. It's not bad at all. <laughs> It's really good. Now I have headphones on right now. I don't want to, I'm going to take them off again after this, but I have the headphones on right now uh, just so that I can hear the off axis rejection. Um, but I do notice that the further away from the mic I go, you can hear a bit of the room here uh, because it really is picking up some of those early reflex reflections. So I did throw up a blanket over here to the side of me, but I have a reflector over on this side and it seems to be reflecting more than just light. And uh, it's a leather couch that's a little reflective. So, um, like I said, the 416 is really sensitive to reflections in the room. So I'm going to take my headphones off for the rest of the video, but I just wanted to uh, say that there is, if you listen real closely with headphones, you can hear a bit of the room. You'll hear it when I put it back on the boom. Here we go. So you've heard this mic the whole time in a semi-treated room. How about outside where it shines? Let's go. Hey, what are you looking at? I don't know. I thought I saw something. What did it look like? UFO or something? No, no, no. Nothing like that. So what are we looking at? 
I don't know. I'm not quite sure. So how long have you been standing here looking up? Oh, I just got here myself. Well, I don't think there's anything out there. Oh, yeah, no, it's a blimp. See? Oh, would you look at that? You can tell it's a blimp by its shape. It's quite massive. Wow. I wonder what kind of huge microphone fits in there. Kind of makes you wonder if we're being filmed on a giant camera or something. The Sennheiser MKH416 can be yours for 999 US dollars. It's not cheap, but it's also far from the most expensive. Yeah. Analysis? Come on. Just come on. How could anyone dislike this mic? Crisp highs, tight lows, great mids, robust, resilient, and strong. Plus the Hollywood movie factor. I mean, I've wanted this mic since I was a kid and saw it in so many film sets, pictures anyway. I had to give up all my vices and extracurriculars just to afford this, but I'm doing fine. If you work in production sound, you need one. Not just because it's a great mic, but also because it's requested a lot from the producers or the people who hired you. Everyone in the business has heard of the 416, and so having one with you will appease your clients. Not having one might lose you the job. I've heard stories. So you can't go wrong owning one. So let's get nitpicky for a moment. It has a very unforgiving pickup beam. You need to be pointing precisely where you want it to be 100% on axis. And you need to follow your talent well because the off axis coloration isn't the best. So it's a very specific pointed mic. I'll also add that it can get a little sibilant when using it very close for that movie trailer sound. Even without being extremely close to it, it can be a tad sibilant. And that's easily rectified with a DS or in post, so it's no big deal, but I thought I should say that. Lastly, I did notice it has a tiny bit of self noise. It's very low and easily managed in post, but I do hear it when I crank it. I cranked it up and then ran the cheap Waves Clarity plugin, you know, the stripped down $29 one. Uh, just a touch and it was gone. Uh, but it's worth mentioning, so I thought I'd mention it. And that's all I could find that may be a negative. But there are hardly anything to pass the mic up for. I mean, pick a movie and you've heard it. It was basically on everything from the 80s and 90s and is still used every day in Hollywood on the most modern of movies. Right now, a boom op somewhere is employing a 416 on a boom for a movie that will likely win an Oscar in 2024. If it's good enough for the best of the best, it's good enough for you and me. It was used fairly recently in The Wolf of Wall Street, Enola Holmes, John Wick, and so many more. It's also used in TV. Fraser, the Connors, and I even saw that they're currently using this mic on House of Dragons. The rest of this video is a testament to the overwhelming positives, and I hope it captures why this mic is still industry standard almost 50 years after it was released. Should you buy the Sennheiser MKH416? Well, if you can afford it, and you're into location sound, narration, voiceovers, foley, and sound effects, then that would be a resounding yes. If you're doing music production, then no. I can't see any value for a music producer or engineer to own one of these. It's not in any way made for music recording. I could not love a human baby as much as I love this mic. And it works beautifully together with my other beloved, the Octava MK012, when combined for both indoors and out in a production. It's a damn fine mic. Damn fine. The Sennheiser MKH416. Get one. And while you're at it, make me a martini. Shaken, not stirred. Bye now. And transmission. I kind of like the couch situation here. It's kind of nice. It's really comfortable.
Kind of slid it out here. What if I change the background, though? Maybe that'll look better. 